So for this panel, Susan Allen is going to be our moderator. And so, Susan, let's begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to everyone from the audience who has taken the time this afternoon to come and hear about intellectual property and artificial intelligence. The name of the panel is Protecting My IP in a Virtual Market. And we're delighted today to have speakers fr from the Global Innovation Policy Center, Mr. Frank Cullen. Then we have Stephen Thrasher, a patent attorney based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Actually, but. And Stephen, uh, Daniel Shapiro, um, who is from Red Point. And I'd like to have each of them talk a little bit about themselves and their companies and the um, relationship to, of what they're doing now to artificial intelligence. And what we'll do is we'll have a few facilitated discussion questions and then after the discussion, open it up to the audience if you have questions for the panel members. With that, um, Dan, would you like to start? Sure. My name is Daniel Shapiro. And I'm uh, director of brand intelligence for a company called Red Points, which is out of Barcelona, Spain. Uh, we provide uh, an AI cloud-based uh, solution to help protect the revenue of brands. We do that through a series of artificial intelligence that help us scan uh, hundreds of marketplaces like Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, DHgate, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We scan those sites uh, looking for infringing product, counterfeits, or piracy uh, for brands. And then we remove them from the, those platforms in order to help the brands protect their uh, uh, intellectual property. Prior to joining uh, Red Points, I spent the last eight years at eBay, and I had created eBay's uh, first ever proactive online brand protection at that counterfeit team. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Steve Thrasher. I'm a patent attorney. I come really to this from a couple of perspectives. One is that I have clients that are actually using artificial intelligence uh, when they file their own patent. Well, they have patent applications that include artificial intelligence in their products. Uh, they've used these to get SBIR grants uh, as well as to um, secure business. The other side of this that we'll talk to is that uh, I have different pieces of software that I use in my own practice that are offered by guys like Daniel, uh, and I'll cover what some of those are, uh, to monitor patents, trademarks, and copyrights for my clients, both in terms of uh, possible infringements, as well as uh, of their own intellectual property, as well as trying to keep them from getting cease and desist letters and notice letters. So we'll go into both of those. My name is Frank Cullen. I'm the Vice President of U.S. Policy at the Global Innovation Policy Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, prior to that, I worked on Capitol Hill for 18 years, uh, where I ran a congress two congressional offices and had the pleasure of working with much smarter people than myself, like Chris Katopis, who was formerly the moderator in the last panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank USPTO for hosting today's event, and also I want to thank all of you for sticking around. I know it's been a long couple of days, but I'm sure it's been very informative. Uh, why would the U.S. Chamber care about the intersection between AI and IP, much less intellectual property at all? Well, it's very simple. We believe that IP helps drive innovative and creative industry sectors that really drive our economy, create jobs, and really enrich and enhance the lives of people around the world, not just in the United States. Uh, IP theft is an existential threat to so many companies, whether it's counterfeiting, piracy, trade secrets theft, whatever form it takes. And AI is a burgeoning field of technology that many of our companies are benefiting from. And certainly, there are a lot of issues around I IP and AI that need to be further explored. Can it be used effectively as a tool to fight IP infringement? Can it be used as a tool for companies simply in terms of their operations? And what are the regulatory and legislative questions around intellectual property and AI, or AI writ large? So these are all very big questions policymakers will have to grapple with. I want to commend the USPTO for the great work that they are doing in this space. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But under Director Iancu's leadership, 
I think you are all well aware uh, that they have embraced AI as a component, not only in their principal mission uh, as uh, the lead on a lot of IP issues, but also in terms of how it can be used as a tool for enforcement. Thank you. So now we will turn to just a very basic question, but what is artificial intelligence? What do we mean when we're talking about that? Uh, I think it means a, a lot of different things to a lot of people. I'll share with you how our company uses it as a definition of AI, but AI or artificial intelligence is an umbrella of, of, of science in which there are subsets of science in there. So for example, image recognition or image fingerprinting or object recognitions are pieces of artificial intelligence. Machine learning or deep learning are pieces of artificial intelligence. And we even use a piece of artificial intelligence called natural language processing, which is, helps us a lot in the social media aspect of finding infringements. But all of those, and there are many other pieces of artificial intelligence, but they fit under the umbrella of that science. And how you take those pieces to leverage them for what we help brands with, that's how we define or how we use uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you. So my, my clients see artificial intelligence from the point of view of, of programmers, typically. And so to them, it's the business intelligence piece of the Microsoft Azure stack, or it's uh, the Google artificial intelligence box. Um, and it, it, it seems to have some magic components to it, you know, when you look at it from the outside and, and just think of artificial intelligence. Um, and it's important to understand that that word is used in the context of human intelligence. Uh, sometimes called natural intelligence. And so uh, I think of artificial intelligence as something that gives suggestions, something that gives users the ability to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So when you add artificial intelligence to human intelligence, you just get better stuff and you get it faster. Um, so uh, that's high level looking at it. When you look at it from, hey, can I get a patent on this point of view? then it becomes a piece in a software stack or some architecture. Uh, when you look at it from what it can do to uh, help people you know, comply with intellectual property rules or get patents and trademarks and copyrights of their own, uh, from the point of view of the user, I think it's this expensive, mysterious thing that just promises better results. And it, it is expensive. Uh, in fact, uh, we were talking outside just before the panel. There are two products I was pitched just last week. And one product to monitor trademarks was a few, well, about a little bit over 100 bucks. Uh, another product was about 1000 And the, th the $1,000 product was based on artificial intelligence. Cool sounding word. How do you define getting a better result and how do you make it real to the customer? That's hard. And so do you guys want to use artificial intelligence uh, it is really a question I, I, I hope to hear some of you give an answer to later. What would make you want to use it? What would make it valuable to you? Uh, just building on what Stephen said, um, you know, at the chamber, we're very intrigued by artificial intelligence. But the question is, you know, fundamentally, what is it and how can it be best be utilized? Um, the head of Microsoft gave a presentation in Washington recently where he talked about the complexity of it and the fact that there are many things we don't know. It's still an evolving technology. At its core, it's machine learning that helps enable different functions to hopefully uh, enable companies to be more efficient, uh, to uh, use AI in a way that's going to help their bottom line and potentially even help them enforce their IP rights. But the truth of the matter is, there is still some mystery. If you think back uh, to the cell phone example, we're now walking around with computers in our hands. 30 years ago, these were briefcase sized devices that had big, huge bricks you had to hold in your hand. Uh, they were super heavy, and they did not have anywhere near the capability. What is AI going to look like in 10, 15, 20 years? How it's going to be implemented? And what are the rules and regulations that we're going to have to have around this so that we actually understand how to use this in a way that can best benefit the entire society, not just those companies that are employing it? Right, well, thank you all. And I think one, you know, a couple of takeaways are that first, you know, there's a whole, there's a lot of money and investment going into creation of AI into the developing side and then protecting those investments through patents and other types of intellectual property. And then on the flip side, it's understanding how we can use all of those new innovations 
in commerce to help everyone um, enforce intellectual property. Um, what I think we could talk about now is to focus on, you know, what is the value of AI now for small businesses? What is it specifically for the individual inventor that, that brings value to them? Because yes, we can talk about the Microsofts and the big corporations, but for someone who's part of a smaller business and hears AI as an ever-increasing buzzword, what is it that they can, could be looking for? Yeah, I, I think, I think for, for small business, uh, and in entrepreneurial, entrepreneur inventors, um, the effort and energy it takes to get trademarks and patents, and I think even more energy uh, associated with the, the inventing of a product and making something that makes our lives better, uh, whether it be through a home product or cosmetics or electronic products, housewares products, all those things make our lives better. The challenge, I think, in today's world um, Amazon today represents about 50% of the total e-commerce business. And what we see is uh, more and more products, physical goods are being counterfeited than ever before. There's a study out that recently suggests that counterfeiting products today is about a $1.9 trillion business and that by 2022 it will be about $4.2 trillion. So while entrepreneurs are inventing cool products and selling them in a competitive marketplace already, so I can't, I can't imagine a worse thing than having to compete against yourself because someone is counterfeiting your goods. We use that AI to automatically remove, find the detect and remove those things and bring a service to brands. And, and, and where a brand couldn't have that tool, we can bring that <coughs> tool to market and help fight that fight and actually allow the entrepreneur in the game of protecting your products just like the patents and trademarks protect your you know, invention. So when, when I'm thinking about what you guys may be interested in, I think of two ways to take this. Uh, one is, do you guys want to hear about how you could use artificial intelligence to, to maybe get your own patent? Is that the interest or is the interest in how could you use artificial intelligence to get better search results to figure out whether your stuff's patentable? Is it, is it one or is it two? Fingers? Three. One, one. <laughs> okay, one and two. There. Okay, so, <laughs> so I, I'll tell you about what I've seen clients use artificial intelligence for and get SBIR grants uh, to cover. And, and I know some of you in here may be interested in some SBIR grants. Uh, I'm gonna give you a hypothetical example. Uh, right now, it takes a lot of computing effort and a lot of energy to just take a still photograph and see whether people are going into a door or out of a door. You know, they, they even get grad students to go, that person's walking this way, that person's walking this way. And they can train uh, artificial intelligence. Now, uh, part of training artificial intelligence is actually giving it human inputs back. You have to treat it like a three-year-old. No, not this way, this way. And in that process, the machine learns quickly how to recognize whether someone's walking in or out of a door. And it might be based on all kinds of little indicators, the, 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 the direction the door is opened or moved, uh, the, the w direction the person's facing, the way their arms are moving. And frankly, we don't know. That's where some of the magic happens. Sometimes we don't know. And so by by describing these algorithms that employ this artificial intelligence or business intelligence system, then the algorithm speeds up much faster, or let me rephrase that, the actual computing part of the process speeds up much faster. I mean, orders of thousands of times faster. And that's the stuff that the government seems to be funding through the SBIR grants. Uh, you also get uh, business intelligence, that's the uh, Microsoft artificial intelligence side in the Azure stack uh, being used for detecting suggestions from big data sets and then presenting the suggestion that might be a surprising result. Hey, if you like these four things, you might also like this. Maybe you've seen that on Amazon. Um, so those kind of systems are being used successfully by, by companies in trying to get a patent. Now, here, here's the, the caveat. 
at this moment, the U.S. Patent Office is submitting requests through the Federal Register for what should and shouldn't be patentable with artificial intelligence. And, you know, if, you know, if you don't want to see another AIA, then get online, look at what they're looking for comments on, and then comment on what you think should or should not be patentable with respect to artificial intelligence. So that kind of covers question number one. Question number two, what are the artificial intelligence-based systems? Um, I can mention the slide presentation. Okay, so I, I prepared a presentation that uh, we just didn't have time to present today. So if you want to see a copy of the presentation, I'll give you this information and some other stuff in it. Again, I'm Stephen Thrasher. Just find me on Facebook at Thrasher Associates is the Facebook uh, group page that I have for my law practice. Send me a note and I'll send you the, the slide presentation. But just within the last two weeks, uh, for trademarks, and, and by the way, use, use some of Daniel's stuff, it's good stuff. Uh, I've gotten uh, advertisements promoting, hey, our products for artificial intelligence from CompuMark, LexisNexis, Markify, but that's for attorneys only. Uh, that's just for trademarks, for copyrights. Oh, by the way, there's a free database that the World Intellectual Property Organization has, WIPO, and it's pretty decent for copyrights, particularly for images. So you might want to go to the WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization page. Uh, there's a copyright tool called, called CopyTrack for visual works, videos, photos, things like that. Uh, there's Digimark for detecting uh, text uh, and, and book copy. In fact, I'm working as an uh, expert in a case where one author in one bizarre genre is accusing another author in the same genre of copying them. Um, in the patent world, uh, I just got to tell you, LexisNexis is the gorilla. Uh, if, if a company kind of pops up and looks like it's making track in the patent world of, of uh, artificial intelligence, LexisNexis acquires them. Uh, I like to say it's a reflection of the state of patent law today. But uh, their products include things like patent site, total patent, patent optimizer, and advisor, and they recently acquired Lex Machina. So there are all these tools that you actually have access to. They're expensive, but you know what? It, I found that if you call the salesman, and I did, and if you want to use a particular one, I'll put you in touch with them. Or you can call Daniel. Uh, they're giving special rates to independent inventors because they know you guys will use the system, and they also know they can call you and get feedback. And they really are in this early nascent stage of business where they're craving feedback. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Do you have anything? Just a couple of points. And I'd like to step back for a moment and talk a little bit big picture. This is a sophisticated audience. Many of you already understand the importance of IP. Many small businesses don't. Many don't realize that sometimes it's the secret sauce or the magic formula that's really going to separate them from their competitor. And they don't think or they don't really have the resources about protecting it as their first order of business. Their first order of business is paying rent, making payroll, making sure they get their product into the market. They're not going to stand up a big IP division or spend a lot of money on some sophisticated AI program to protect their IP, typically. That said, uh, it's tremendously important that people understand the resources that are available to them, but also understand the right types of IP protection, whether it's a copyright, trade secret, patent, uh, trademark. So it's very important small businesses identify how they can best protect their IP and then how they might utilize AI to help protect that. Uh, following up on what Stephen said about uh, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization puts out a lot of information. It's a great website, just like USPTO has a lot of information on their website. US Copyright Office, US Small Business Administration all have lots of information for small businesses, and I encourage you to go on those websites. You know, one thing about AI and how it can be helpful is not just how it can be used in the commercial sense, but also in terms of the process of applying for IP protections. We see good work, particularly here at PTO, in this area to try to streamline the patent process, but also how to make information available to the public and the small business owner. According to WIPO, in 2016, which is the last year data was available, 
There are 3.1 million applications for patents, some 7 million trademark applications, and almost 1 million industrial design applications worldwide. The volume is staggering and how you can actually identify you know, what products are out there and which are protected by these different types of IP uh, protections. Tremendously important to rights holders and to small businesses to know whether or not they're jumping into something where they may not be the first in that field. So do your research and make sure you understand which type of IP applies to you. WIPO also now has an AI-empowered image search tool for trademark. It's embedded in the WIPO Global Brand Database. And this is a first for WIPO, but it delivers results quickly, highly accurate, and also in collaboration with the AI experts at the Geneva University. To Stephen's point, they recently launched an automatic patent classification tool. So there are a lot of tools out there that are not just commercial applications that you might be able to license or use for protecting your intellectual property, but there are also a lot of resources through different agencies throughout the world. Thank you all. Um, it's very helpful and very useful information. I want to open it up to the audience now, and then um, if there are other questions or we have time, we may go back with some a deeper dive on some of these topics. But does anyone have, oh, and before I get into that, one comment. I know at the beginning we had this um, request for photographs with an Amazon gift card, and I have been advised that we are not allowed to do that type of promotion. So. Um, well, applause for the innovation and the creativity. We do have some regulations that have to stunt on on that. So, um, you mean that was not USPTO sponsored? That was that was not oh. USPTO sponsored um, or endorsed. So, um, just that's a little disclaimer there. But now I'd like to turn it over to the audience for questions of our panelists or statements about how you're working on AI or would be helpful too. Uh, I had a question about uh, AI in like, like app development. Are you able to patent like an AI part of your app? Or can you not hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, the AI art group unit has a relatively, for software, high allowance rate. So you're saying that you, so you, I've heard that you can, I guess, patent an app, but if you do have something that's particularly important that's not, I guess, broad, you can patent that? Well, I don't know who said you can't patent an app. Yeah. Uh, so you got to be real specific about what is and is it patentable about what specific app. Uh, you, I mean, you can't just broadly claim a, a function. You can't just broadly claim uh, you know, mathematical formulas now, you, you, which is interesting. When I started practicing 25 years ago almost, uh, almost the surest way to get a patent allowed was to put a mathematical formula in your application and track it in your claim. Um, but um, the, the specific answer to can I patent this is going to require going to a patent attorney with experience in this area. Uh, you know, your, your general attorney won't know at all. Your general patent attorney may not know. You, you got to go to a patent attorney that's really dealt with and wrestled with artificial intelligence based patent applications before. Okay. Question over there. Yeah, just uh, reviewing what your topic and following topics, I don't quite know where to put this question. I hear rumors that if you get an international patent and then you file for a U.S. patent, that you, it'll be processed faster. Is there any validity in that? So there, I guess I'm the guy to answer that. Uh, so the U.S. and international systems uh, when, when you describe the international system or quote unquote an international patent, just be aware that there is not an international patent. There is a patent cooperation treaty and other treaties that you can use to go into regions and countries, but it's always on a specific country basis. Uh, I am aware of some corporations, some of them large, 
that are filing patent applications in regions that they perceive to be more patent friendly, uh, including uh, Europe and sometimes including, believe it or not, China. Uh, and sometimes they will use a grant of that application uh, depending on other treaties and ask for something called modified examination in another country. Uh, I am not sure whether the U.S. recognizes a modified examination based on an application filed by a U.S. inventor and then prosecuted overseas. By the way, I'm getting really deep in weeds here, so pardon me if I'm losing anybody. Um, but uh, if we do accept modified examination, that actually lowers your presumptions when your patent issues. You still have to go through the full examination to qualify for all of those you know, uh, presumptions that, uh, I mean, they're, they're less important today than they were, say, 10 years ago. But, but you're affecting your application in lots of ways. But that, that may be what they're talking about. I'm unaware of anybody that's using that strategy a lot who's used it successfully. But I have heard a lot of chatter about it. Just following up, um, it's tremendously important that small businesses recognize that this blank, this idea of blanket immunity somehow, uh, because you have a patent in the United States, or it might be deemed to be compliant or consistent with treaties we have, is not sufficient. You, you have to make sure that if you're going to do business in a particular market, you are filing your IP protections, because no matter how good an AI system is to protect or detect against IP theft, if you have not filed and registered your marks, your patents, your copyright protections, you know, these are all things that need to be done in every market that you're doing business in or you create exposure. So as a small business, take care of the basics first to make sure that you're protecting yourself where you're doing business. I was just going to follow up. That's an excellent comment. We, we deal with a lot of small entrepreneurs and we, as we detect and look for counterfeit or infringing product, we often find it in places, whether it's in Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, uh, China, uh, South America, and people's uh, intellectual portfolio doesn't allow us to remove those infringing items in the places where we find it. So we can only help the brand remove uh, infringing product where they have their portfolio uh, uh, capable. So we often say to those brands, well, what do I do about all those infringing counterfeit items? Well, they're concerning because they will make their way to the domestic market or people in the U.S. can buy from those locations. So it's one of those things you really have to, I, I think what uh, uh, he mentioned, which is you got to really get your basic foundation of your IP portfolio uh, put to bed. And I think Frank's suggestion is extremely important. Thank you. I have a question for Stephen. I'm looking for an attorney with knowledge about machine learning, text, visual, uh, video. Uh, how do I look for a specific, because it's not easy to, to see on, on their website. So I, I can contact you, but how do, do I have a, a list of uh, attorney in that specific area? Uh, wh where are you located? San Francisco. San Francisco, okay. So you can find patent attorneys that are registered to practice in the patent office that are located in San Francisco, actually at the Patent Office website. Once you find that list, you just got to pick up the phone and, or either start sending lots of, e sending lots of emails. Yeah. They, they don't have a place. Okay. Nah, there's a, now, some are more active than others in uh, local software communities. Uh, and it, so, for example, in uh, Dallas, we have an artificial intelligence society, and uh, I, I attend those meetings. So you'll, you'll find uh, the attorneys that know that stuff and, and are really interested in it going to the artificial intelligence society meetings, look for the MIT Enterprise Forum, their meetings, uh, look for uh, the alumni associations of the big tech schools. Thank you. Should I take someone from San Francisco or is best work in uh, local or can I get uh, someone from the East Coast? Sure. So uh, assuming that what you're talking about is the preparation of a patent application 
and, and not litigation and not those things, uh, then you, you are allowed to look nationwide. Uh, you might prefer working with an attorney that you can look across the table and show something to and say, wait a minute, you don't understand this. I'm coming over to your office now. You know, that, that's kind of hard to do if they're in uh, Salt Lake City or, you know, uh, D.C. Well, we certainly are not recommending any specific attorneys. Uh, you know, I can tell you that it does help to have folks who understand, you know, specific jurisdictions and business uh, sectors that are particularly prominent in different regions. There's going to be a broader pool of potential talented and effective attorneys, you know, depending on what you're looking for in those jurisdictions. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Raghu from uh, Maryland. Um, most of us are uh, individual inventors or small entities in this uh, gathering here. And uh, there are two aspects. One is detecting IP infringement in other countries as well as here. It's a very expensive process for us. And uh, the second part is enforcing that whatever we have discovered. So it is extremely expensive for us to do this both in this country as well as in other countries. Would you have any suggestions or take on this for us? As it relates to infringing product uh, or copyright issues or patent related issues, uh, counterfeiting uh, is illegal everywhere in the world. It's not, it's not as easy necessarily to enforce it everywhere in the world, but it is, it is illegal everywhere. And every platform that I know of, from uh, Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, DHgate, Facebook, um, uh, Bukla Pak in, in Jakarta, they all have a place for which you can, if you find an infringing item, you could actually report it yourself. I mean, if you took the time and you found it there, you could uh, follow their rules and report that item as an infringement. It does take a lot of work. It can be done manually for sure. Um, some people use an internal team, maybe a couple college students uh, 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 on a part-time basis to do manual searches, look for those things, follow the guidelines on each of those platforms to have those items removed. But they will remove it very fairly quickly within a few hours uh, of notification because uh, they're motivated to remove it as long as you provide all the pertinent information associated with that. And I think back what uh, Frank said, as long as you have the intellectual property for that particular region, uh, that's the critical uh, element. If you don't have it, they wouldn't remove it. But as long as you had that, uh, a pretty sophisticated portfolio, uh, you could do it yourself, um, uh, as, as a lot of people do. Sometimes they'll use an attorney to write letters, which will be good. It can be expensive to maybe sometimes use an attorney to send one letter at a time, but there are ways to do it. And of course, third-party providers like the company I work for, uh, we specialize in, in small business, um, and, and you know we can do that. But there are multiple options to do it. I would also suggest, not to disagree with Daniel, but uh, it depends. Individual experience vary, um, and there are certainly a lot of folks who are very frustrated with the processes that have been put in place by different platforms yeah. to take down infringing materials, and it's a huge time suck. Uh, you know, as somebody who has uh, brought someone who is a small business owner to the U.S. Congress to testify about her experiences, one example is a small, small business wedding designer who is really a victim of her own success. Her stuff was being counterfeited, and believe me, if you have a product that's successful, it's going to be copied and you're going to get ripped off. And so she was having a lot of counterfeits coming in. Her only market was the United States, which has a strong IP system and a strong enforcement system. She wound up spending all of her time, or the vast majority of her time, fighting infringing copy, uh, counterfeit, you know, fake dresses that were cut flooding in, mostly from China. And she wound up having no time to design product. Her brand was diminished as a result of a lack of quality counterfeits that were out there. And ultimately, she went out of business. So the truth of the matter is, you do have to be, be very diligent about your enforcement efforts. It's a cost of doing business. Take advantage of law enforcement and rules that exist. You know, there's a national IPR center here in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, the USPTO has a link to their site to report IP crime. They are 
25 agencies across the world, including Europol, Interpol, DOJ here, FBI, uh, you know, a ton of resources through the National IPR Center to fight IP crime. The truth of the matter is it's tough, and when you have to deal with jurisdictions where they don't have robust IP protections or laws in place, it's going to be tougher. But it's a cost of doing business, and if you don't do it, counterfeits are going to challenge your brand, and you're going to really be you know, competing with yourself. So to jump in on a real quick answer to keep your cost down, um, look at filing design patent applications if they apply to your product. Uh, also look to copyright registrations. Uh, those are much cheaper to move internationally. Uh, a lot of clients use what uh, we call the English language strategy, which is to focus on the nations that accept English applications. Uh, that way you don't pay for the cost of translations because when you talk international protection, the cost of the translation is often 50% or more, sometimes 80% of the cost of filing internationally. So if you, with design applications, there are very few words, so you don't have as many uh, translations. Frankly, you have fewer translation errors as well. Uh, but, but go for the low-hanging fruit on that, and that's going to be your copyrights and your design patent applications. And one last point on that, if you don't have representation in country. Oh, you have to, get yeah. good representation in country who understands those systems and has relationships and can hopefully navigate what might be a very tricky minefield for you. in uh, patent infringement protection. Only the copyrights and trademarks or FBI and the customs is involved in protecting the infringement of copyrights and trademarks, but not the patents, apparently. Is that and, true? And tr I would add trade secrets. Yep. Very, mm -hmm. The FBI is very, very hard. Trade secrets. And trade secrets. Yes. Okay, so um, when searching for these AI companies, uh, what should we look for in... Hold that up from here. Oh. Uh, when searching for the, the best com uh, AI companies, I'm sure that I assume that there's, there's several different kinds and they run for different businesses, uh, considering technology to clothing to, you know, et cetera. Um, so what should we look for in those companies uh, in finding the best uh, way to keep our uh, company safe? I, I couldn't hear the. I didn't really what would be the best company uh, if you're looking for somebody who's going to be the right fit for you? you know, what should you be looking for, and what are the companies that are going to be, be the best match for your business? Is that? Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I think you need to know what the outcome you're looking for is, right? I mean, it, it, what your challenge is. If your challenge is fighting counterfeits on a marketplace, then you need to look for companies that specialize in that space, you know, such as we do. If you're looking at it from a standpoint of filing patents or uh, uh, trademarks uh, and your outcome is how, how you do that quicker and cost effective. I think you would look at some of the companies you mentioned. So I think your outcome is sort of the key component uh, to help you in that search process. Yeah, to, to add, I, I would just say it just depends on what's important to you. You know, price, quality, speed, you know, time to delivery, of, of a search result, if that's what you're interested in, assistance with enforcement. Uh, if the offering that every business has is different. And so you just have to know what you're looking for. And while there are a number of companies in this field, so for instance, there's a company called Entropy. Um, it's particularly utilized by luxury brands. Uh, it can identify uh, and analyze various materials ranging from canvas, leather, to metal and wood. A uh, vast majority of the leading brands now utilize it to detect fakes in the marketplace. But there are other companies that really specialize in using AI within blockchain to make sure they have a supply chain that's secure. So I really think to Stephen's point, it makes a huge difference understanding how the particular product that a company who specializes in an AI type system fits your business model. 
you know, are you looking for something to track something through the supply chain? Are you looking for something to just det detect whether or not somebody is trying to copy your brand or your product in a specific market? It really depends on what it is your problem is and how the AI can be suited to solve that problem. Good. Hi, I'm asking about software. In branding, sometimes using open source software, the author will say, please leave this comment in there. My question is, is that enforceable? And what does it fall under? And for images, there's metadata, and you can put your author, et cetera, and whatever text you want in that metadata, so you can track where that image shows up on the net. If you create a set of SVG files, you can put comments in there and create yourself as, comment to yourself as the author. Is that enforceable? And is it more branding? I'm not asking for money. I just want the name and the brand, my that brand, to be acknowledged in the creation of that digital art or digital code. Yeah, that, that kind of goes to which of the open source licenses you're developing under. Yeah, exactly, because there, there are, what, 60-something open source licenses that are pretty active, you know, uh, GPL3, MIT. Um, the Apache, so you just have to dig into the specifics uh, of the one you're interested in. Uh, look for the ones, if, if you look up uh, copy left, have you heard of that phrase? It means that when you copy the code, you have to include this license as part of the code that you give away. Um, that, that phrase, those kind of licenses tend to have the don't change anything provisions in them. And uh, that might be the solution to what you're looking for, might. To Steve's point, it is really more of a licensing question than it is a criminal activity or even a civil issue. That said, um, make sure you understand what you're licensing and actually what you're signing. So uh, open source has become you know, a, a tool that a lot of folks believe is essential to innovation writ large. Uh, but just be concerned if you want to get a return on your creation or invention, uh, you know, you probably have to have a pretty strong licensing agreement or some type of IP protection. I was thinking more about branding and, and how that goes to the enforcement. Because the source code, your name is there. You can do a text search of across files and across sites for mm -hmm. your name. And if it's, you think it's there, it's I would think it's fairly easy to detect before, but after it's compiled, it gets difficult, and that's where the AI comes in. Yeah, you, you, can, take, uh, you can take imagery or listings down on marketplaces that uh, are brand name misuse, where they're using your name maybe to sell some other product, or they've taken your image, uh, and uh, that copyright is recognized. Uh, we can remove a listing for utilizing an image that doesn't belong to the person who listed it. So. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but for, it's, it, is, it is enforceable across marketplaces and social media platforms to take down imagery for sure, or even the use of your name, if it's a trademark name. Uh, they don't have the right to use that name on those platforms, so. Yeah, also check in for your state rights, because rights to person vary state by state. And say if you're in California, you might actually have uh, better rights under state law. So we have um, the time limit. We have about five minutes. And I do have one final question for the panelists, but we have maybe time for one or two more yeah, questions. Uh, hey, hey, how, how about I? Um, I actually have some uh, uh, AI-related ideas and also work in the neural network, uh, those type of things, uh, on and off last uh, probably 20 years. And uh, so my question is, uh, on the very top level, from US, US PTO perspective, or even from WIPO, from a global perspective, are, are people, are the policy makers, or people high in the ecosystem trying to make AI sort of more open, less, uh, so less patent intensive uh, area, uh, probably similar to software, or, or are open to make it more patent intensive area? So I think that's that clear question. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a big policy debate and question that's going on right now. Uh, it's not just a question of you know what should be patentable in terms of the specific 
technology or program, uh, but it's also a question of, writ broadly, you know, how much do we want government to regulate? You know, how much do we want to control the growth of an industry in that sense? So uh, I don't think there's a clear answer yet, but what I can tell you is that big institutions like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Congress, USPTO, a lot of policymakers are looking at these questions and trying to figure it out because they understand the important role AI is going to play going forward. And the one thing I'll tell you is it's very dangerous to try to legislate ahead of technology. Technology, particularly in today's world, develops at such a quick pace that if you have rules in place based on today's technology, you're going to be obsolete, obsolete in terms of those rules pretty quickly. So how you get the rules right is tremendously important. Hi, my name is Chris Rasmussen. I'm from the Pittsburgh area. Um, I was wondering whether any of you had a, a know of the company called Dorothy AI, which is a, uh, uh, the very brand new uh, AI um, technology for searching patents. Um, it's actually uh, now just officially launched. I was wondering whether any of you had, had known of that. It's a friend of mine that actually launched that company last year. Hmm. Um, but if not, you should probably check it out. Dorothy AI, just like Dorothy from Wizard of Oz. So, um, so uh, any quick, uh, any quick way to uh, access AI technology in the patent search process without being a patent attorney? Go to LexisNexis. LexisNexis. Yeah. Okay. I think that's probably the the shortcut. Pick. They have about on their. Uh, patent, uh, what do you want to call that, a sub-page, landing page. Uh, they have about six different products you can choose from. If you call one of their representatives, tell them who you are, tell them why you're using it, uh, offer them feedback. That, that seems to be the trick to getting them to cut you a deal. Yeah, um, it, it is subscription or pay to play. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's what I would do. And, and you might want to go, I mean, if you're in, in Pittsburgh, uh, see if Carnegie Mellon Yep. Uh, has a subscription to it that you can get access to. Yep. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. So I have one final question for the panelists, which is, you know, what does the future hold um, for AI? What do you think you would like to see developing? Um, and, bef and then after that, I'd like to thank our panelists for their time today. I, I think in the world of sort of detection and enforcement, the space I'm in, um, we are moving at uh, uh, light speeds and looking to automate. Today, uh, to give you a sense, there's about two to four billion items being added every day to the e-commerce platforms around the world. Uh, if you take a day off and searching, you're already going to be, you know, four billion items behind. And so, how how to uh, how to keep up with a marketplace that is moving at such a speed is extremely challenging. And today, we believe that through some version of automation and through some version of automated, not only automated detection, but automated enforcement to protect brands is really the challenge. Um, uh, we are also seeing today from a perspective of this e-commerce uh, world, a new marketplace is generally created about once, one, one new marketplace about every one to two months there's a new marketplace and about every three months we're seeing a new social media platform pop up where people are listing products. So the speed of e-commerce is uh, uh, you know, greater than we could kind of imagine. And I think the future of AI is how do we uh, match that speed? I don't know if we can get ahead of it, but can we sort of catch up to it would be the challenge of what companies today are thinking about in our think tanks is how do we maintain that speed of to match the speed of e-commerce? So in the short run, I think it's about automating and making much faster processes at bottleneck points. I particularly see this in labs. So for example, uh, today that uh, we have the ability to do gene manipulation down to a single gene in, in certain therapies and certain uh, pharmaceutical applications. And the bottleneck to get those into markets, laboratory testing and getting them through the safe and effective regulations in the FDA. And, you know, this is, this will sound crazy, but, you know, automating 
the growth of a fungal pattern in a petri dish <laughs> and turning that into something that is accepted as an AI outcome and can reduce the time to lab results from two weeks down to microseconds actually will impact our lives in ways we don't foresee today. Then in the medium term, uh, I think AI with respect to suggestions will impact us on an individual level. You'll wake up in the morning and it will say, hey, Bill, wouldn't you rather listen to this song this morning because it will remind you of this and this happened four years ago on this day. You know, you won't think through that process, but that's what will be happening. And so we will actually see individual suggestions being made to us based on behaviors and based on preferences we're not even aware of. Um, and so look for those kind of life enhancements in the medium term. In the long run, all bets are off. I have no idea. Not only might AI recommend the song you're going to listen to, might write it. Uh, <laughs> so from the standpoint of knowing that what Steve just said is 100% true, we just don't know. Uh, what we do know is that there are certain components of AI that are already being developed to help small businesses and to help IP rights holders in ways that are pretty simple but are going to accelerate at an incredible pace. I used the example earlier of the cell phone. It's amazing how quickly technology begins to move. So you're going to see more efficient processes for attaining IP rights, which may help from a scale standpoint bring costs down. Uh, you're going to see IP enforcement by agencies like Customs and Border Protection utilizing AI in ways that allow detection of counterfeits coming into the United States to protect consumers. You're going to see potentially companies using it in blockchain and other applications, not just to track and more efficiently move product, but also to make sure they're detecting fakes that are getting into the system through all sorts of different types of markers that will be embedded in products that the AI can detect. And then, of course, you're going to see things we can't even conceive of, to Stephen's point, which is, what is AI going to think of? You know, at some point in time, what is it going to invent that we might not even have thought of as a potential application? And that's a very real potential, even though, so far, it's what we put in is sort of what we get out. We don't know really ultimately how the human brain works, and we don't know how AI, excuse me, AI is going to work when it really begins to mature. So what the future looks like is very exciting. It's also something that is very difficult to predict. But I can tell you one thing, from a rights holder's perspective, there are going to be tangible benefits from AI, and they're already here. Thank you all. Definitely some food for thought. And thank you to the audience for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.